you to turn the wheel of Dharma. Our Gurus, you are our Idams, 
etc., etc. Three times, as we say, a three times is a commitment from us that we only submit to enlightened beings. We do not worship or submit or go along with evil beings or malevolent beings or beings that are harmful or beings that look pleasant but in the end they're quite harmful. So in Buddhism, no one ever submits or prays to or takes refuge or goes near malevolent beings or negative beings or harmful beings. And although some of them can help us immediately, in the long run they're quite damaging, quite, quite damaging. So therefore, it's, it's a supplication to the Buddhas. By supplicating the Buddhas, two things happen. One is, we actually make a physical connection. We actually make a physical connection to the three jewels. How do we make a physical connection is when we supplicate them from our heart then we are invoking them to bless us, to help us, to assist us, and to bring us to their level. So therefore, when we supplicate the Buddhas, it is a direct affinity we are making with the Buddhas. People always say, oh, if I have this, I have affinity. If I'm meeting this, I have affinity. If I can meet a Guru, I have affinity. If I can meet my Yidam, I can have affinity. If I can practice the Dharma, I can have affinity. If I can have good things, wealth, position, then it's because of good affinity. Yes, Chinese people believe that in order to have something or to do something or to come across something positive, we must have affinity. Or in Mandarin, I think you call it yuan. So affinity is definitely believed in the Buddhist principle. The Buddhist principle of affinity means to have the luck or the fortune to obtain something or meet someone or to do something that is very good but we need to go one step deeper we need to have the affinity how to have the affinity we must create the affinity how to create the affinity we must do something physical or mental or verbal toward the buddhas so when we do something physical mental and verbal toward the buddhas we create the affinity so instead of sitting out at home waiting for affinity hoping to have affinity, hoping to have good luck, hoping to have wealth, hoping to have fortune, hoping to have removal of obstacles, hoping to be protected, hoping to have a long life, hoping for freedom. Instead of hoping and waiting in your home, you can create it. How can you create affinity? You can create affinity by the power of your aspiration, by the power of your prayers, by the object that you supplicate. The object that you supplicate is very, very important. If we're supplicating a tree, I don't think we'll be making much affinity. If we're supplicating a Rolex watch, I don't think we'll be making much affinity. But if we supplicate the Buddha, or Bodhisattva such as Kuan Yin, or Wen Supasa such as Manjushri, or Lama Tsongkhapa, or we, pass, or we supplicate Zambala, Whatever those deities represent, we will create that affinity. So if we supplicate Lama Tsongkhapa, if we supplicate Lama Tsongkhapa, we will find harmony in our family. We will find harmony in our environment. We will find harmony between us and our children, our children and our parents, harmony between our friends, harmony in our neighborhood, harmony in our area. Lama Tsongkhapa is the main Buddha for creating very powerful harmony very very powerful also afflictive diseases mental diseases depression the biggest scourge of the 21st century the biggest scourge is depression lack of happiness due to depression anxiousness claustrophobia feeling tight or closed in feeling trapped feeling like no hope feeling down about ourselves or having very low self-esteem and hiding the low self-esteem by anger, hiding the low self-esteem by cover, hiding our low self-esteem by being rude and mean and not nice to other people. This is the biggest affliction of the 21st century. Why? Last time people would supplicate the Buddha, such as Tara, for those of you who might not know Tara, she's a beautiful female Buddha sitting over there. The last time people were supplicating Tara to free them from wild elephants, 
because wild elephants and jungles are very frightening for people who live in the past. And snakes, and bandits, and robbers, uh, water, being drowned in water or fire. Those kind of fears we don't have anymore. If there's a fire last time, people immediately pray to uh, help. And many things will happen, miraculous things will happen. These days, if there's a fire, people get the fire extinguisher. You don't need tower thief. In fact, maybe a little more quicker. Last time, if you see a wild elephant, you can get inside your Jeep and go out very quickly. Last time, no Jeep. This time, got Jeep. So don't need to pray to Tara. But now, we have electricity. We have comfortable house. We have amenities. We have running water. We have everything we need to live very well and to be very, very happy. Yet, physically, we are very comfortable. Free from mosquitoes, we wear nice clothes, everything is convenient, everything is easy. But mentally, we have more stress, more depression, more worry, more anxiety. So to counter this, to counter this, a very good practice is Lama Tsongkhapa. So Lama Tsongkhapa, I find it a very wonderful Buddha for the Kali Yuga age or for the modern 21st century. Why? Modern 21st century people suffer tremendously tremendously from what? Internal difficulties, internal problems, internal obstacles, and difficulties and unhappiness that arise from internal, not so much external anymore. Last time, very, very much external. So therefore, 21st century problems for young people, we find huge cases of young people committing suicide. Tragic, huge. Why? Everything's supposed to be easy. Everything's supposed to be wonderful. Everything's supposed to be very nice. So why are suicide cases on the rise? Therefore, depression, feeling claustrophobia, feeling of closed in, no hope, tight. Lama Tsongkhapa is supreme. When we do meditations on Lama Tsongkhapa, when we do Lama Tsongkhapa's mantra, we are invoking the very deities the very enlightened energies and the very enlightened power that counter mental afflictions. When we invoke Lama Tsongkhapa, when we invoke Lama Tsongkhapa, we are invoking, listen very carefully, listen very carefully. When we invoke Lama Tsongkhapa, we are invoking the energies that directly counter mental illness, mental unhappiness, depression, and strife. Let me repeat again. To hear that, we require lots of merit. Even to hear, we require lots of merit. I'm not kidding. To hear it, we require a lot of merit. A lot. Many obstacles and distractions come. To counter, to counter modern problems, and difficulties, modern. And the modern problems and difficulties is what? Pressure, depression, anxiety, fear, self, lack of self-worth, feeling we are not worth something. And then from feeling the lack of self-worth, feeling a lack of self-worth, we create tremendous problems for people around us, tremendous. We are afraid to take commitments. Why? Because deep down inside, we know that we have not proven ourselves to others in ourselves in the past, and we have failed in many items and many endeavors. So therefore, we're very scared 
very scared to take commitments. And in fear of our lack of self-worth, we also try to make ourselves very beautiful. We try to make our appearance very beautiful. And we focus, making ourselves beautiful, there's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But to focus only on external beauty and to spend our time and energy and resources on only external beauty and not developing the inner beauty is a clear sign of lacking self-worth. Clear sign. Why? Because we wish to attract other people's attention. We wish to attract other people's love. We wish to attract other people's blessing and approval. So we focus very much on external appearance. But if people try to get close, or people try to ask us for more, or try to request us to do more, we say no. Why do we say no? Because we don't have a feeling of self-worth inside of us. Why don't we have a feeling of self-worth inside of us? It could be environmental, something that's been planted in our brain when we're very young. It could be that we come from a very good family, so we've never been pressed or forced to do anything of value. Everything's been taken care of for us, and therefore we're very afraid to leave that protection, protection circle. It can also be that we have tried many things in the past, and due to lack of effort, we have failed. So there are many, many factors that contribute to our lack of worth. Our lack of worth, listen carefully, our lack of worth does not mean we have no worth. Does not mean that. If we ourselves believe that we have no worth, then we would not do anything to attract anybody. We wouldn't even concentrate on grooming ourselves. We wouldn't even concentrate on cleaning ourselves. We wouldn't even concentrate on making money. We wouldn't concentrate on having a nice car. We wouldn't concentrate on that. Let me say something quite rude, but those of you who know me for the last 15 years, it's gonna be quite mild. But for you new people, you're gonna say, why does a Rinpoche from Tibet talk like that? What should a Rinpoche from Tibet talk like? What should a Rinpoche from Tibet act like or look like? You have your own projections. So don't project your projections on me. I am what I am. Somebody else famous said that too on Mount Sinai, but never mind. Now, you know how in school or in high school, or you know how you go around and you see Men, you see these flashy, beautiful cars, shiny, maybe convertible, or they have big mufflers, they make a lot of sounds, the windows go up and down, even the windows are tinted. And don't you always see these cars stopping at the red light, and you see the passenger inside whistling at the girl next, next to her, him, you know, parked at the car next, or they pull up in curves, or they pull up in discos, they pull up in, in places where they can be seen. And these cars are so flashy and shiny and beautiful and wonderful. And all the girls turn around and look. All of them look. And then when you look inside, what does a guy look like? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? What does a guy inside look like? Usually scary. Usually frightening. Usually someone that if you saw them walking up and down the street, you don't see them. <laughs> but when they come up in this flashy bright car, all the pretty girls turn around and look. And all the pretty girls whisper. Even the not so pretty girls whisper. And even some of the boys whisper. In our group, many boys whisper. Why is that? Now, guys who have it, they don't need big shiny cars. They don't need big loud roaring engines to get what they want. They just walk down the street and everybody looks. So what's my point? My point is, if we actually didn't care about ourselves, if we actually felt that we are totally worthless, we wouldn't engage in anything that makes us look good at all whatsoever. So my point is, when we feel self-worthlessness, or we feel we're not worth something, when we feel that, it is not the end of the world. It does not mean we don't have worth, because innately, we are trying to get worth or develop worth. Then what about girls? Okay, let's be very fair. What about the girls? How, 
much time do they spend getting their hairs done? How much money? Nobody's looking at Crystal. How much time and money do they spend getting their hairs done? How much time? How much? And you know, if one slight wind blows, they freeze because one single hair moved. And then, do you think that women can live without mirrors? I'm not a woman, but I can. Do you think that women can actually live without a mirror? Have you ever seen a normal, sane, not retarded woman walk by a mirror and not look? <laughs> Have you seen? And how much, how much makeup do they put? How much? How much effort did it? Hours and hours and hours of makeup. Cannot go in the sun. Need two umbrellas. Protection. <laughs> and then neck down, you know, you know the kind of things that women do to their bodies to make themselves attract. What does that mean? Some women do that. Some women do that because they don't feel self-worth inside. Some women do that for other reasons. There are many, many reasons. Not all women who do that mean they don't have self-worth. My point is, it is clear evidence, clear evidence that we all do feel something inside that we want self-worth. But my point is, when we try to get self-worth through exterior material methods, it is like drinking salt water. We get thirsty again and again and again. If we use internal methods to get self-worth, internal methods to get self-worth, then it will be lasting. Very, very lasting. Example, if you build a house with strong foundations, no matter what you do, the walls will be very strong and not crack. If the foundation is not strong, if you build the walls, it'll crack. No matter how much you patch it up again and again and again, the walls will crack again and again and again. Therefore, to build from inside out is tantamount to happiness. Tantamount to happiness meaning what? It is a necessity for happiness. So therefore, when we supplicate or perpetuate or pray, pray is not what many of the Malaysians here think. Fold your hands, shake it in front of a deity, you pray. That's not pray. Pray means to open yourself. Who you are, what you are, and how you are inside to open and surrender to a higher force. When you open and surrender to the higher force, you reveal yourself. When you reveal yourself, you face yourself. When you face yourself, you can come across the difficulties that you have. So the fears that you have can be eradicated and addressed and eradicated. The good points you have in you can grow and blossom even bigger. So when you open yourself to a higher force, it's very powerful self-therapy. That higher force can be a trained psychologist, a trained therapist, who knows how to talk, who knows how to gently get information from you for you to examine yourself. That higher force can be a spiritual teacher. Doesn't necessarily have to be Buddhist. Not necessarily, definitely not. There are compassionate teachers of all religions who sincerely help others from a compassionate mind, not bias. That higher force can be our mother. That higher force can be our father. That higher force can be a friend that's known us for a long, long time. That higher force can be a Buddha. That higher force can be ourselves reading a psychology or self-help or some kind of book that helps us to understand ourselves better. So that higher force can be many, many faces. Many, many faces. But in this case, the highest force is that of an enlightened mind. A mind that is free from anything that can fetter or trap or drag it down to a lower level. So that would be a Buddha mind. A Buddha mind doesn't necessarily have to be an oriental or Asian deity. Doesn't have to be like that. A higher force is represented by these deities that we see here. 
in fact, the actual deities don't even look like what we have here. They're much more glorious, much more splen splendorous, and much more beautiful. These are just representations of the higher force. So for new people here, when you pray to the statue, I want you to remember, you are not praying to the statue. You are using the statue to remind you of a higher force, to remind you of an enlightened being. And you are praying to that enlightened force. Dual. A, you're praying to the enlightened force outside, which has gained enlightenment. And B, you are supplicating the enlightened force within you. In you, you have the energy to become an enlightened being. You are supplicating that. So when we pray to the Buddhas, we are opening ourselves up. We are surrendering ourselves up. Surrender means what? Mindless robots, mindless slaves. No. Surrender means what? And I want to make this very clear for my friends here. Uh, surrender means you do not lose free will. You do not become mindless or idiotic. Surrender here means to reveal and open your faults. To open and reveal your failures. To open and reveal your mistakes. To open and reveal your negative actions of the past. Why? As long as we keep these things hidden, as long as we keep these things hidden, they will haunt us. How do they haunt us? They haunt us by what we call habituation. We are haunted. You know, Malaysians are very, very scared of hantus. Very scared. You just tell someone, hey, I saw something, I felt something, there. they're like, are you really young? They, they immediately, they run the other direction. You tell any Malaysian, any, I don't care if they're big ones, small ones, fat ones, male, female, any Malaysian you tell, Kakos, Kahantu, immediately they run. Immediately. All of them. There are one or two freaky Malaysians who actually invite them. <laughs> I won't tell you who they are. I dare not, because then you'll avoid this weirdo. There are a few, one or two freaky, freaky Malaysians who invite them, who want to be their friends, who ask them to even go inside of them. Can you imagine asking hunters go inside of you? So can you imagine yourself inside? Just visualize yourself inside. Hi, Hunter. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you now. Oh, are you? Now what do I do? I don't know, but I'm gonna kill you. Oh. Maybe I look for llama. Do what you want. Can you imagine the hunter inside of you? Having this conversation inside of you? And there's two of you inside of one body. Some of you two hunters can fit. <laughs> Where's Loki? <laughs> ah, yeah. That one, two hantus can fit, maybe two and a half or three. People like me, only one can fit because I'm very thin under all this. Very, very thin. Now, some people actually invite these hantus, invite these spirits, and they want them to help them or talk to them or do things. And sometimes they even set up altars to hantus or wear little pendants, or do little magic spells, or do little prayers in Hindus. Very scary. Very, very scary. My point is, when we pray, let me define prayer for you. You're new, you made the effort to be here, you made the effort to come here, let me give you education. Let me give you spiritual knowledge. That's what you're here for. Whether you consider yourself Buddhist or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It's just a label. Whether you consider me a high lama or a nobody, also doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If I'm a high lama, you don't think I'm a high lama, I'm still a high lama. If I'm not a high lama and you think I'm a high lama, I'm still not a high lama. So it doesn't matter what you think. So if you think a high lama should act like this, talk like this, and do like this, and I don't act and talk and do like that, too bad for you and me. If you think a high lama talk, act, and do like this, and I match what you think, good for you, good for me. In the end, it doesn't matter. In the end, when you leave this room tonight, when you leave this room, you have to get knowledge. Do not make this another, go to the temple, offer some incense, and 
do some cheat chanting and do a little bit of cheat prayer and then you just disappear. Don't do that. Make today worthwhile. How do you make today worthwhile? By me sharing with you spiritual knowledge. That is my job. What will you do with this spiritual knowledge? Hopefully, when you leave here, when you walk down and you leave here, some of the darkness in your mind has gone away. Some of the ignorance, meaning darkness, has gone away. Also, more knowledge has come so that hopefully if you engage in real spiritual practice, you will get somewhere. Do you want to go to the temple for another 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, in the heat, chanting, not knowing what you're chanting, praying to some statue, not getting any knowledge, 20, 30 years later, you're still frustrated, you still don't understand, you still don't know what's going on, of course not. In Buddhism, it's very much treasured that the teacher gives knowledge to those who attend the teachings. And the way I give knowledge is very different. I don't tell you what to do. I don't say you sit down like this, you put your hands like this, you put your feet like that, you use this mala, you use this rosary, you, you have this book. I don't tell you that because those are all superficial. Those you can figure out on your own. What I tell you is the basis of your mind. What I explain to you is how your mind functions, how your mind operates, how your mind creates happiness and unhappiness. And I tell you in different angles. I tell you in different methods. I tell you in different perspectives and I tell you on different levels. Hopefully, why? When you get that knowledge, when you leave here, your spiritual practice will grow. So whether you think of me as your guru, or root guru, or no guru, or whatever, it doesn't matter also. It doesn't matter. So high lama, low lama, I'm your guru. I'm traditional. I'm not traditional. Who cares? That's your projection. You believe a lama should look like this. You believe a lama should talk like this. You believe a lama should act like this. That's what you believe. That's what you see on TV, the magazines. That's what you see on the cheap posters. That's what you see. That's your projection. That's what you believe. And also, how lamas act 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, now has to be different. Has to be different. And if I was traditional lama, many of you will run away. <laughs> many of you. You think you can take traditional lama? Then you have to be traditional students. If you want a traditional lama, you have to be a traditional student. And you know what a traditional student means? Cooperation, doing what the lama says, not talking back, not being disrespectful, offering up your wealth, offering up your un non <coughs> commitment meaning you offer up your full commitment. Do you think you're traditional? I don't think so. Do you know what traditional means? It means that even in a room, you're not allowed to sit on a chair, touch your legs, or fold, or twist, or talk doing a Dharma talk. That's what traditional means. How do I know? I come from a traditional monastery. I have 14 lamas, 14 root masters. Trust me. I didn't sit on a chair playing with my feet or playing with my arms or twisting here and there or looking for a better seat. I didn't ask if there was air conditioning. I didn't ask if the place was comfortable. I didn't talk or move or twist my limbs at all. And those teachings went on between 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day and that goes on for 20 years. So do you think you can be traditional? So hence, if you cannot be traditional, why do you want your Lama to be traditional? That's why you got me. <laughs> You're not traditional. Why are you not traditional? Because you want spiritual practice. But you want it according to your culture, your upbringing, your understanding, and how you feel you can incorporate into your life. You see, when you enter spiritual practice, in my case, you're not trying to be a Tibetan. You're not trying to be a, a, a Himalayan person. You're not trying to be someone from um, um, the, uh, Nepal or India. You're trying to take the ancient, vast knowledge that Buddha taught and incorporate it into your life. So therefore, in today's world, 
non-traditional method. For me, I find much more easier to approach people, easier to talk to people, easier to be with people, easier. Why is that? You break across barriers. If we did it in a traditional way, you will be stuck in all the protocol, in all the etiquette, in all the manners. You'll be stuck in all sorts of Tibetan traditional etiquette and manners. I don't think you could take it. But those etiquette and manners have a purpose. They are in order to develop self-restraint. When we show respect to our lamas in body, speech, and mind, the main purpose is not cultural. The main purpose is to show self-restraint. When we can be self-restraining in front of our lamas, we'll be able to be self-restraining around other people. If we are not even able to be respectful to our lamas and teachers and masters, how will we be like that to everybody else? Why? We respect everybody else even less. So, in today's world, there are many different types of lamas out there. Many types. Many, and the lamas are very, very compassionate and they're very, very kind. I know that personally because they have many different types of people to teach. So they show many different types of outer appearance and many different types of methods. So it's very important for all of us not to judge or to look at the outer appearance or to judge at the outer behavior. We have to see what the message that the teacher is teaching. The message, the message. Is the teacher teaching us how to be rich? Is the teacher teaching us how to be beautiful? Is the teacher teaching us how to fight and be ugly and be mean? Is the teacher teaching us how to stir politics or create sectarianism? Or is the teacher stressing and teaching us how to be kind, how to forgive, how to create harmony, how to create awareness, how to push ourselves to become a person that other people will be happy to be around and also we will be happy to be around ourselves. We must check the message of the teacher, not the method, not the method, not the outer appearance. Why is that? I'm finding an excuse for myself to be wild, crazy. No, I am gonna be what I am. No one is accountable for my karma. I am accountable for my own karma. I know my own karma. Does anyone think they know more than I do regarding karma? Does anybody think they know more than I do regarding behavior according to morals, according to the vows, according to monk vows, according to tantric, according to sattva vows? We can talk about it, we can debate. No problem. So therefore, my point is this is, when we supplicate and we pray to the Buddhas, when we supplicate and we pray to the Buddhas, it is to open our pain, open our fears, open what we've been hiding for many years inside. If you don't open, then whatever you have fears, whatever you're hiding, or whatever inverted commas mistakes or negative actions you have done inside, it will grow, it will grow, it will grow, it will become bigger, and the habituation will be very difficult to cut. So what happens in the end, even we want to change, we want to transform, we want to be a different person, we want to be beneficial, we're not able to, we are stuck in our habituations. Why are we stuck in our habituations? Why? Because we have never opened up our fears. We have never ever surrendered our fears. Some people focus on physical appearance because inside they don't have much knowledge. Inside they don't have much knowledge, they don't have much exposure, they can't affect or effect many people outside. So they don't want you to focus on the inside, they make you focus on the outside. Why? They want love, they want acceptance, they want care. They want that, everybody wants, I want. Everybody wants love, care, and acceptance. So they have nothing on the inside, so they try to focus on the outside. So some people, nothing much on the outside, they try to focus on the inside. And they focus and they push and they push themselves on the inside. What I'm trying to say is, when we pray, when we open our hearts and we fold our hands and we put our thumbs inside representing a wish fulfilling jewel, our aspirations, a wish fulfilling jewel is our aspirations. Why? Aspirations 
eventually become manifestations. They openly manifest what we have prayed for. So when we fold our hands and we make aspirations, aspirational prayers to the enlightened beings such as the Buddhas, we are creating affinity. Listen carefully. When we do our prayers, when we pray, when we open up and we surrender, our negative points, me and you, all of us, all have negative points. We have good and we have bad. The bad we don't need to surrender because we want to. The bad we need to surrender. The good we don't need to surrender. We don't need to. Example, in a house, you want to sweep out the cockroaches and dust and, and all the mites and, and all the cobwebs, right? You don't want to sweep out your diamonds and your gold and your Mercedes car keys. You want to sweep out your, your, you know, your FD uh, bonds. You don't want to sweep that out, right? Similarly, when you, go, when you sweep things out, you sweep out the bad. You keep the good and you increase the good. So when we pray to the Buddha, it is not reciting holy words. Kachar House Buddhist Organization has beautiful, beautiful prayer books, beautiful prayer book that has traditional prayers translated into English. And they are very, very wonderful for us to do every single day. And they are very powerful mantras. And how we make those prayers come true, how we make the mantras effective, here's the secret, is to open our faults, open our wounds, open our fears, and surrender up to the Buddha. Our wife may not know, our husband may not know, our friends may not know, and people around us may not know, and our teachers may Pretend they don't know what's going on in us. Maybe like that. Maybe like that. But my point is, when we pray, we have to surrender our pain, our fear, and our insecurities up to the Buddhas. How do we do that? A, by self-reflection, meditation, contemplation, on what our fears are, where they arise from, how they come. You can be your own therapist. How do we do that? The more Dharma teachings we read, the more Dharma teachings we listen to, the more Dharma teachings we read and listen and think about, that becomes our therapy. That becomes our therapist. Dharma is therapy. Listening to Dharma will give us a very powerful therapist. A therapist or a psychologist that can help us must go for intense training. Six to eight years of intense training or study or university. Similarly, if an intense psychologist or psychiatrist or a therapist must go for that kind of training in order to unlock the secrets of the mind on a superficial level, if we want to be our own therapist, do you think you can attend Dharma teachings once a month? Or you attend uh, half asleep? Or you, you think you can attend that your mind is he, your body is here, but your mind's thinking about what when I have for supper after this? You cannot. So if you are here 100 percent, if you are here 100 percent, and you open up and you listen, when you listen to Dharma, when you get Dharma knowledge, you create your own therapist inside of you. You create. With this therapist, it is not saying that you're crazy or you're bad. It is saying that it is someone very powerfully trained within your own consciousness that can help you to push yourself to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. So when there's a Dharma talk, traditional Buddhist countries will flock for it. Traditional. Why? That's how you get knowledge. Chanting and meditating is wonderful. But if you don't know Dharma, what are you chanting about? What are you meditating about? You can train a three, four, five-year-old child to, med to, tr to chant. It doesn't mean they're doing spiritual practice. You can teach a parrot to recite mantras. It doesn't mean the parrot is going to be a Buddha. So are we a parrot? Are we a child? No. So therefore, it's very important to make time and effort toward Dharma teachings. It's very, very important to make our priorities. We listen to Dharma teachings. We make it there. And we also are in the right frame of mind. We've eaten something. We're clean. We're pleasant to make our minds comfortable to listen. It's very important. It's very important to do supplementary research, meaning at home, you also do reading. 
you also do not one chapter a year I know some people the books cannot even open anymore already stuck together from years of no use why should you get that knowledge because it'll help you who goes to university and gets a degree by never studying their books this is even higher so therefore you can be your own therapist how can you be your own therapist how by getting knowledge by getting a yardstick to compare your mind to. If you have a yardstick to compare your mind to, it is not a comparison to put yourself down. Oh dear, I feel guilty, I didn't do that, so I'm not going to listen to the teachings. I'm not going to go see my teacher. I'm not going to go pray. I'm not going to go chant because I feel guilty. Every time I open up, every time I listen, every time I hear, it makes me feel guilty. That's ridiculous. That's twisted, perverted learning. People say, I don't want to attend Dharma, I don't want to do Dharma actions or Dharma practice, or I don't want to listen to Dharma teachings or attend because I feel guilty or makes me feel guilty, is absolutely another ego trip. Why is that? You're feeling guilty is because you're using the Dharma as a yardstick to show how bad you are. You don't need that. There are so many factors out there telling you how bad you are. You get a nice hairdo, you go look at some uh, glossy magazine, you go, oh, someone's got a better hairdo, you suffer already. <laughs> you go out there and your new Proton watch out, then some BMW drives by, you suffer. Right? Then you, you go to the gym, you work three hours, and you lose... Not even one kg. And then you see some skinny person walk by, feeding their face, eating chocolates, hamburgers, listening to music, and you ask them to go to the gym, they never go to the gym, you suffer. Think about it. You're suffering all the time. So we have enough measuring sticks out in the world to make us feel bad. We have enough measuring sticks out there to make us feel horrible. There's enough measuring sticks out there to make us feel that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Dharma is not meant for that. If we take Dharma as someone that punishes us, if we take Dharma as someone that puts us down, and we always have to confess, and we always have to regret, we always have to feel guilty, we always have to keep our head down, we become a fanatic. Then you become one of these people, you know, like in middle America, Tennessee or Alabama, they hold Bibles and tell you what you can do, what you cannot do, what you can do. They're doing everything themselves anyways. Or well, you have one of these people, one of these Buddhists to run out here and they hold their books, their Buddhist sutras, and like, you can't eat meat. <laughs> you didn't do your five hours of chanting to Yin today? Why does your guru have hair? <laughs> you belong to? What practice do you do? It's like a witch hunt. <laughs> Gurus who come to Malaysia, they get it. They, they, you know what happens? They, they, after they go through immigration, that's a big a big hassle. Once they get through immigration, right? Then all the disciples here, they take them to a small room with a light on their head. <laughs> they shine the light on their face and they don't give them any food, no Tibetan tea, no nothing. And they ask you, what lineage are you from? Who's your guru? Aha! Where's your monastery? What sect do you belong to? And what color is your hat? <laughs> and then you have all these high gurus in their suitcases like oh, So scared! And then they go on forums, they go on the net, and they go on websites and they chat with each other about the gurus. What they wear, who their lamas are, who their lineage is, why they have hair. Why? And they talk about this on the net, and then they say, is he a monk? Is he a real teacher? Is he a real Rinpoche? <laughs> and then, before the Lama can even talk, they already pack their bags, they're going back to Tibet. <laughs> Too much examination. Too many tests to pass. Can you imagine a bunch of lay people who don't know any Dharma, who run around having and that means things we do in the dark with another human being. All right. My word for that is bubali. I don't want to say the S word because some people say, oh, Rinpoche can't say that, you know? Why not? So let me just say bubali. And people who drink, and people who have 20 kids, and people who spend the whole day having money, and people who go and make themselves beautiful, who spend, they do more on their hair than their sadhanas. They spend more time on their hair than their sadhanas. And then lunch and breakfast and dinner, and they're so into their food. These people, they want to turn around and judge the Rinpoche's, 
and they want to jump to the monks and they want to judge the teachers who hung out in South India or India with the scorpions and the snakes with no electricity, with the monsoon starving to death, studying the Dharma, sitting there 10 to 12 hours a day with their butt flat as a pancake, not mine, flat as a pancake. And they've been studying Dharma for years. And then when they come here, they go, they immediately the spotlight. And their river just like, who are you? What are you? What's your lineage? What's the color of your hat? What do you practice? And what Buddha do you pray to? <laughs> well, when they shine the light on me, I turn around and shine it back on them. <laughs> See, I'm not one of these people that bite my nails and hide in a corner and get afraid. When they push me to the corner, I push them back compassionately. <laughs> oh yes, very compassionately. So for me, for me, don't look at the package. Don't look. I know it's a little hard to avoid the package. Don't look at the package. Because there's nobody in this room taller than me, broader shoulders than me, nicer chest than me, and greater long legs than me, and fairer than me. And nobody here except for that guy over there has a bigger double eyelid than me. So my point, let's not compare the package. You like that, don't you? <laughs> my point is what? Listen to what the Lama is saying. Listen to the message. Listen to the meaning and listen to where the Lama is trying to guide you in order to check if this is the right Lama for you. You want traditional Lama? Plenty. Just take a helicopter and just parachute yourself down in Tibet. Millions of them. All these traditional Lamas, they sit on high throne, they don't talk much, they don't joke, they eat one grain of rice per day, they have two more, they see deities, they fly, they have, they have the emanation body. There's so many around them. Sorry, not here, you only got me. I don't see deities, I don't have an emanation body, you know, when it gets cold, I don't have Dumo, I have to wear a coat. I don't have any magic powers, too bad. But I do have knowledge. I do have Buddhist knowledge for you. I didn't study a lot, I'm not a scholar. Nobody in Tibet calls me a scholar. It's okay. As long as I don't go to three lower realms when I die, it's alright. Scholars still go there, some of them. So it's okay for me. Now, if you want the traditional Lama to sit on a high throne, you know, emanate Tumo, see deities, and they're on another planet, and, and, and uh, you can't talk to them, you can't touch them, you gotta sit on the floor, you gotta sit there all the time like that, go to Tibet. Now, if you want someone who can be your friend, who can talk directly to you, who can explain to you and you want knowledge, you come to the right place. You come to the right place. Why do you come to the right place? I'm not here to make you Tibetan. I'm not here to make you today, but I can give you spiritual knowledge. I can do that for you. If you take the time, and you take the commitment, and you take that step, and you push yourself to learn, I can give you spiritual knowledge. Now if you say, oh, I can't make it to the Dharma talk because I have a dinner appointment. Oh, I can't make it to the Dharma talk because I have to go and make more money. Or you can't go to the dinner talk because uh, to the to the dharma talk because you've been driving your big flashy car around and you picked up another pretty girl. <laughs> no, you have to be committed. And then when you come to the dharma talk, when you come to the dharma talk, what's very important is this: we're just here for two or three or four hours, just for a few hours. Think of all the information I have to cram into your heads in a few hours. You don't have any basis. You have not studied much, no, no offense intended. You have not much practice and not much knowledge. You're coming in from the cold. And I've got to sit here and give you 2,500 years of knowledge in just two, three hours. And in those two, three hours, some of us, we are like sleepy. Or some of us, you know, our neighbors are telling us to shut up because our stomach is making noise. Or we're, we're thinking what's going on, we're looking here, our legs hurt. Yeah, I agree, you can be hungry, you can be tired, your legs hurt, but if you make an effort and you listen, it will be very, very, very beneficial for you. Why will it be very beneficial for you? Because what benefit have you achieved in this life without any difficulty? What benefit have you achieved? So in our center, 
you're not going to find a traditional Lama. You're not going to find a holy Lama. You're not going to find somebody who flies in the sky and, and has rainbows coming out of his backside. <laughs> you're not going to have some Lama with his hair tied up on top with turquoise and wearing earrings and, and hitting drums nonstop while he's talking Dharma. Oh, mommy, oh, mommy, oh, mommy, oh, mommy, oh, mommy, oh, mommy. No, you're not going to find that. You're going to find a Lama that doesn't meditate, has no attainments, no powers. You're going to find a Lama that barely speaks his own language, Tibetan, can't even read his own language, sad. You're going to find a Lama who sits on a big throne because he bought himself a big throne, thank you very much. But what you will get is knowledge. You'll get knowledge with time, with effort. And if that's what you want, if you want sectarianism, if you want gossip, if you want politics, plenty outside the door. Plenty inside this door. I do not go into politics, gossip, rumors, negative talk, lama bashing, monk bashing, tradition bashing, lineage bashing. I do not go for that. Why? It is very heavy karma. Okay. Very, very heavy karma. Even to engage in it is very heavy karma. And people who waste their time bashing lamas, bashing traditions, and bashing dharma, and bashing teachings, and bashing practices, they waste their time. They should use that time to actually meditate do their sadhana, so do retreat. If you have time to bash a lama, you have time. If you have time to bash a lineage or bash a center, you have time. That's the secret. So transform that time into something more benefit. If you use one hour, two hour bashing, politicizing about lamas and lineages and practices and who's good and who's bad, when you don't have knowledge, you have put no effort, you have no vows, you have done nothing with your lives but to eat and sleep and have a good time, and then you want to politicize or you want to criticize, it's very dangerous. Why? If you were to die tonight, that politicizing bring you no benefit. In your next life, you can be born as a mute. Harsh talk or negative talk that harms others, you can be born as a mute. You can be born with mouth problems, meaning can't talk well, lisping, or problems to talk or speech, or people can't understand you, or your speech brings unhappiness to others. Your speech brings unhappiness to others. Your speech bringing unpleasantries to others also cannot be understood while also irritating or frustrating to other people. Your speech, or any problems with speech, comes from the direct result of you not speaking the truth. You using your mouth to create schism and to create harm to others. Schism is when you create misunderstandings so people fight and go apart. So therefore, in this life, we'll be born with a type of speech that always creates misunderstanding. Even you don't want to anymore. Even you don't want to. Why? Remember the secret. Result resembles the cause. The cause resembles the result. So if we have speech problems, we should engage in the practice of Lama Tsongkhapa, especially Om Arabasanati, very strongly. Om Arabasanati, with concentration and meditation. And we should stop all speech that is unclear, not direct, salacious, that goes round and round, that's schismatic, also that's harmful to others, and also that creates more schism. We should stop. And speech that's not direct, meaning, you know, you want something, you dare not say it, you go round and round and round, you manipulate it. We must stop. That kind of speech is very dangerous for one's spiritual practice. Why? For five, ten minutes of your day, you do your mantras. You make it one hour, two hour. But the other 22 hours, 21 hours, what's your speech engaged in? What creates more karma? Why do you think one hour or half hour of chanting will cover the 22, 23 hours of negative speech? It's impossible. Impossible to cover that kind of speech. So speech is very important. And if we don't use our speech correctly, we may be able to get away with certain things now, but in the end, it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Is this a yardstick? Yes, this is a yardstick. Is this criticizing? No, I'm not criticizing you. I'm giving you a yardstick. Dharma is used as a yardstick so that you can be your own therapist. So when you go for Dharma teachings, you hear things that are unpleasant, don't be angry. When you go to your Dharma teacher and your Dharma teacher tells you things that are unpleasant, don't be angry. When your Dharma teacher pushes you to do things that are, you feel not possible, but your Dharma teacher feels it's possible, don't be angry and do it. I'll tell you why. Perhaps someone else can push you to another level, a higher level, a higher level. That's the whole reason we submit to a guru. We submit to a guru not so we lose our free will. It is to submit to a therapist. If you go to a therapist or a psychologist and you're very close and you don't open, you don't talk, how do you expect to get healing? How? 
Similarly, you, when you submit to a therapist or psychiatrist, you're not giving up everything. You're not giving up your freedom, you're not giving up your independence, you're not giving up your free will. Definitely not. Definitely not. You're just giving up your pain and the source of your pain and where it's coming from. Therefore, when we submit to our guru, it is not mindless, slave, stupid, no free will submission to the guru. Where God like that? And, and gurus don't even want a bunch of mindless slaves. They want smart people who run around making money for them. Oops. So if they're a sneaky guru, they'd rather have you smart, independent, and do what you can so you can make money for them one. If they're a holy guru, they want you smart, independent, so you can meditate and practice to become a Buddha one. So even if, if they're evil, inverted commas, guru, they still want you smart, independent, self-thinking. And if they're a holy guru, they want the same. No guru, evil or good, would want you stupid, mindless, robotic, blank slaves. What for? Then your guru have to come and change your diaper, feed you, <laughs> wash you, tell you to go to sleep, tuck you into bed. I don't think your guru would want to do that. No way. I don't think your guru wants to come and, okay, now little Johnny, go to sleep. I don't think so. So submitting to the guru, do not get the wrong idea. Submission to the guru, submission to the dharma is not mindless, stupid, not thinking, no self-will submission. Submission to the teacher, Submission to the Dharma, submission to a lineage means healing is likened to submitting to a therapist. I want everybody to be clear on that because there's a lot of new people here. I get a lot of email inquiries and divination inquiries and people always asking, what does it mean to have a guru? How do I find a guru? What do I do with my guru? What is a guru? All the time I get asked that. Why, why, why? And some even ask, why do I need a guru? <laughs> because you're not a Buddha. I, I always think there's something really mean like that, but I try to hold myself because I'm a guru. Anyways, what's my point is, it's not mindless submission. No, it's not. It definitely is not. How can you be a mindless bunch of robots practicing Dharma meditating? You think the guru's gonna sit with you 24 hours a day and tell you what to meditate on, eh? <laughs> you meditate on the light, B, the light goes inside of you, C, oh, I mean, the light goes on top of you, then goes inside, you get all mixed up anyways. No. When you submit to the Guru, listen carefully. For old people, meaning who's been in Dharma for many years, and newbies, some of you first time, when you submit to a Guru, you submit to a therapist. And if you always resist treatment, how do you get healed? How do you get healed? Then if your guru is his holiness, his his eminence, his his fabulousness, his wonderfulness, his his blah blah blah, and he's got twenty five thousand incarnations, and you know he's been on this planet since the dawn of time, and and then you see him once every five years, and you get maybe one hour of dharma talk, it's not very effective. Not very effective. If your guru is his holiness, the Dalai Lama, you cannot go wrong. But how many of us in this room have the extreme fortune? to travel, to live, and to be at every single teaching is holding skills. I've had many fortunes in the past to receive teachings from Mill Holmans. In fact, my vows come from him. Many great fortunes. But I don't have such merit to hang around him 24-7. Why? He belongs to the world, not to temperament. So, I have other gurus who his holiness Dalai Lama has given me certain teachings, certain initiations, certain practices, and I don't have time to go and harass him. Hey, your holiness, can you give me a teaching on this? Can you do a divination? Can you, can you help me? Can you help me? No, no, he doesn't do no time. He's got to help me. So what I do is I go to my other teachers, my gurus, and I get information. And I learn. And I practice. No point running around. Oh, who's your guru? His hairiness. Blah, 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 blah. The pachi of tea And like, it's another ego trip. Why? Because your guru's big, big shot. You're a big shot. If your guru is someone high, you're someone high. If you have the affinity to be someone high and to be your guru, of course you're somebody. It becomes an ego trip. So you'll see people running home. My guru is his holiness. A blue blah blue blah blah blue blah blah. And you're like, oh brother. You're like, boy, so this luck went down. We met you. That's what I think. <laughs> Rude, isn't it? His all his luck cannot go down. Cannot. So don't, if you are high quality, if you are superior, if you meditate, you practice, and you've given up the attachment to the senses, and you're very high level in your, in your knowledge, then you can say your guru is his holiness, this, 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 then you don't embarrass them. 
you don't embarrass yourself and you don't chase people away. Because people say, well, look, you're, you're holding holiness now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me run for someone who's not a holiness. <laughs> and hence, Tamar Chi's room is filled. <laughs> not everybody understands that, I know. <laughs> Some of us are looking around like, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Not everybody has prayed to Manjushri today, I understand. I know, I know. It's okay. Relax, relax. Calm down. Take a deep breath. I'm not stupid. It's just I didn't, I didn't understand. I'm not stupid. I didn't understand. I'm not stupid. Rimji's not telling me I'm stupid at all. And then your friend said, you are stupid. <laughs> okay, so when you surrender, when you surrender to the Guru, when you surrender to the Dharma, this is the secret here, and this is what you're going to share with your other friends. This is what you're going to share with yourself, once and for all. When you surrender to your guru, when you surrender to a lineage, or you surrender to a dharma teacher, you don't surrender your free will. You don't surrender yourself. You surrender your grasping and hiding and holding on to what hurts you. And therefore, what hurts you makes you hurt other people, because you can't let go. They say, well, why don't I see a psychiatrist? Simple. Tell me when she's free. <laughs> Very easy. Tell me when she's free. <coughs> Psychiatrists come and see Tell me when she has their problems to meet. <laughs> they do. Psychiatrists come to see Tell me when she, and Tell me when she counsels them. So, so what happened? Were you touched when you were 12? I asked the questions too. Yeah, not everybody understood that I know. <laughs> I'm not going to point out who didn't understand, but half of you are sitting there like, touched. <laughs> Maple laughs very loud when I say touched. <laughs> Things that happened to her when she was a child. <laughs> now, so that's what surrendering to the Guru means. You don't become mindless. Definitely not. No. There are, and some of us, it's very normal, including me, some of us, we have problems inside of us, we have a lot of anger. We have a lot of rejection. We have a lot of fear. And many of us in modern day, it's a very big modern day epidemic level fear is lack of commitment. Afraid to commit to something higher. Afraid to commit something bigger. Afraid to commit to helping others. It's a very big epidemic fear. And that fear is very strong because why? Materialistic Materialism distracts our mind it takes our time away and it makes us focus on things that just distract our mind further. So when we're very distracted in taking care of ourselves, having a good time, making ourselves beautiful, having good food, talking about gossip, running to restaurants, running here, running there, when we're very committed to that, of course it's very hard to do Dharma practice or commit to Dharma practice. Why? Because we already are using our time for something else. Now when people say, I'm not good at commitments or I can't commit, I don't agree. I don't agree at all. Why? If we look at ourselves, we're very committed to many things. We're very committed to the way we look. We're very committed to making money. We're very committed to having good food. We're very committed to having a good house. We're very committed to having a good partner. We're very committed to having good clothes. We're very, very committed to get the best car. Very committed. And most of our activity is focused on getting those things. So when our activity is focused on getting those things, what does that tell you? It means we're very committed. Commitment is what? Is every day an effort toward achieving something. That's commitment. So when we say, oh, I don't have time for Dharma. Oh, I can't commit. Oh, I'm afraid to commit. Oh, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Oh, that's a big responsibility. I got one mentor for you, BS. That's right, BS. Why is it BS? Because you're very committed. It's just what you're committed to. All of us can be committed. All of us. 